waiting for us. There we are. And then I'm going to go ahead and put up Mr. Carrizales' PowerPoint for him. And lastly, I'm going to be putting up the Math 1324 link if anyone needs it in the chat. Without further ado, here is Mr. Carrizales. Thank you so much, Patricia. And welcome everyone to our last um, happy math hour for the summer. Uh, for all, for those of you who want to join in to do the review for the Math 1324, um, the link, as mentioned, is on the chat. So I'll give you a few seconds for those to transfer over. Very good. So again, welcome everyone. And today's session is just to review for your all's final exam, um, which is sometime this week. Hopefully, you're all. Um, are going to do very, very well. So hopefully this review helps um, with any final questions you might have. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so let's look at this uh, first problem. It says, find any intercepts and test for symmetry with respect to both axis and the origin. So as you all may know now, to find the x or y intercept uh, graphically is where the graph crosses either the x-axis or the y-axis. And to find this point algebraically, if we wanted to find the x-axis, we set y equal to 0. And if we wanted to find the y-intercept, we set x equal to 0. So let's go ahead and get started. So if I want to find the x-intercept, again, I'm going to let y equals to, equal to 0 and solve for x. So um, the equation is y is equal to minus 2x plus 1. So where I see y, I'm going to set it equal to 0. Okay, I replace y by 0. Now I need to solve for x. So I'm going to subtract 1 on both sides. This is going to give me negative 1 is equal to negative 2x. Then I'm going to divide both sides by a negative 2. And when I do that, okay, a negative 1 divided by a negative 2, the signs um, change, right? With a negative 1, a negative divided by a negative is going to be a positive. So x is equal to 1 half. I simplified, right? So my x-intercept um, is when y is equal to 0, x is equal to 1 half. And that's how the computer wants to for us to put the answers. You can see it wants the answer as an ordered pair. Again, we always put x and then y next, yes? So our point would be 1 half comma 0. So that is our x-intercept. So to find our y-intercept, we're going to set x equal to 0 and solve for y. So everywhere I see x, I'm going to replace it by 0. So we have y equals negative 2 times 0 plus 1. This one's easy, right? So negative 2 times 0, that's 0. And 0 plus 1 is just 1. So when x is equal to 0, y is equal to 1. So as an ordered pair, um, it would be 0, 1. And this is going to be my y-intercept. Okay. Now, so if we were to graph it, again, this is a line. Okay. We can pick these two points to graph our line. You know, we could do um, 1 half 0, which is right between 0 and 1, and 0 and 1, these are the two points, and we draw our line, yes? So now to check for symmetry, okay? So there's several rules to check for symmetry. So the first rule is if uh, we have x-axis symmetry, if we have the same value for um, a positive y and our result also gives us a negative 1, okay? If we have, um, so for example, let's check to see if it has the x-axis symmetry. So we replace y with negative y and solve for y, okay? So let's go ahead and do that. So we have negative y is equal to a negative 2x plus 1, and let's solve for y. So divide both sides by a negative 1 to get rid of the y. Uh, excuse me, to get rid of the negative. And we see that the equation is 2x minus 1. 
which is not the same equation. So this is does not have x-axis symmetry. So let's test for the y-axis symmetry. So just like before, to have y-axis symmetry, this means that um, if we replace x with negative x and solve, um, we should um, get the same equation again. So let's go ahead and do the same thing. So replace x with negative x. So here we have a negative times a negative is going to give me a positive. So we have y is equal to 2x plus 1. Again, it's not the same equation, so it does not have y-axis symmetry. And the last one to check is origin symmetry. If I replace both the x and y by negative x and negative y, and if I solve for y, let's see if I get the same equation. So we replace the y with negative y, the x with negative x, solve for y. Um, before I did that, I had multiplied negative 2 at times a negative x. This gives me a positive 2x. Divide both sides by a negative 1 on both sides. And we get y is equal to negative 2x minus 1, which is not the same equation. So on this problem, since it's not x, y, or origin, this one has no symmetry. Okay? Oh, and I didn't check it off, but this should be no symmetry. Okay? All right, any questions? Very good. So let's go ahead and move on. All right, so the next one is write the standard form of the equation of the circle with a given characteristic. So they gave us the center and they gave us the radius. So to review, okay, the standard form of a circle is given by this, x minus h squared plus y minus k squared is equal to r squared, where h and k represent the center and r represents the radius. So on this particular problem, they're giving us the center, which is, again, h and k. So my h is negative 4, my k is 2, and again, my radius is 2, so that r is equal to 2. So let's go ahead and plug these values in. So we have x minus a negative 4, and then we square that, plus y minus a positive 2 squared equals to 2 squared. So let's go ahead and simplify. We have a negative with a negative. This is going to give me a positive. So we have x plus 4 squared plus y minus 2 squared, and then 2 squared is 4. And Voila, this, oops, this is my answer, yes? So this is the standard form of the circle um, with these characteristics, the center at negative 4, 2, and the radius at 2. Okay. Any questions? Very good. So let's move on. Okay. So on this one, it says, write the equation of the lines through the given point parallel and perpendicular to a given line, okay? So on this one, we're, we're going to use several um, formulas, okay? So first of all, um, in order for us to, to be able to find out what is the parallel and perpendicular, we need to find out what the slope of this line is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert this equation, which is in general form, and convert it into slope intercept form. So slope intercept form is going to be y is equal to mx plus b. So let's go ahead and do that. So to solve for y on this equation, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract 8, 8x on both sides. And this is going to give me a negative 2y is equal to 3 minus 8x. Okay. Then I'm going to divide both sides by a negative 2. So this is going to give me y is equal to a 3 divided by negative 2 minus an 8x over a negative 2. Let's go ahead and simplify. A positive with a negative is going to be a negative. A negative with a negative is going to be a positive. Yes? So to put it in, in, in standard form or general form, in, I guess we could call it standard, and the slope-intercept form, we have y equals 
negative 3 halves plus 4x. We simplify, yes? So 8 divided by 2 is 4. So what we see here is that our slope is 4. So let's go ahead and do the parallel first. We know that for a line to be parallel, it has to have the same slope and different y-intercepts, yes? So let's go ahead and use what they're, they're giving us. They want us to go through this point and be parallel to this line. So let's go ahead and substitute the values into what's called our point slope formula. The point slope formula is given by y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, where again, x1, y1 is the point that we want to go through, and in our case, x1 is 8, y1 is 1, and again, m stands for slope, and we're going to use slope, slope of 4 because that we want the parallel line. So let's go ahead and substitute these values. We have y minus 1 equals to 4 times x minus 8. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to distribute the 4 into um, this x and minus 8. So we do that. We are going to have 4 times x is going to give me 4x. 4 times a negative 8 is going to give me a negative 32. So the last thing that I need to do is solve for y. So I'm going to add 1 on both sides and simplify. So we have y is equal to 4x minus 32 plus 1. And negative 32 plus 1 is a negative 31. So this is the equation of a line that is parallel to this equation because they both share the same slope. They both have a slope of 4. Okay. Any questions? Very good. So let's go ahead and move forward. Let's go ahead and find the perpendicular. So to find the perpendicular um, equation to this line, again, we need to give the perpendicular slope. So to find the perpendicular slope, we're going to take the reciprocal of this number. And again, this number can be written as a fraction, 4 over 1. So the reciprocal of 4 over 1 would be 1 over 4. And we want to change the sign. The sign is positive, so we change the sign and make it negative. So this is going to be our perpendicular slope. Okay. And again, we're going to use our point slope formula again to find this perpendicular equation. So let's go ahead and substitute. Again, the, the point that we want to go through hasn't changed. It's still x is equal to 8, y is equal to 1, but our slope changed. We want the uh, perpendicular equation, so our m is going to be the negative one-fourth. So again, we're going to distribute this negative one-fourth. So when we do that, a negative one-fourth times x is a negative one-fourth x. A negative one-fourth times a negative a is going to give us <clears throat> a positive two, yes? A negative times a negative is a positive, and a divided by four is two. So our equation um, that is perpendicular to this line is going to be by simplifying. Um, I had to add 1 on both sides, so 2 plus 1 is 3. So the perpendicular equation is y equals negative 1 fourth x plus 3. Okay. So again, to find parallel um, similar equations, they have to have the same slope. And for perpendicular, you can think of it as having opposite slopes, yes? All right, so let's go ahead and move forward. Let's um, look at these two functions, okay? So we have function f of x, which is given by 9x plus 1. Um, hopefully by now we all see that this is an equation of a line, okay? Then they give us this equation, g of x, and it's given, it's, stated as x squared minus 4. And I know this is a quadratic because of the exponent, right, the, the squared. So they want us to do a basic operation. They want us to add these two functions together, add function f with function g, okay? And I always like to rewrite it so it, it makes 
better sense. What this is saying is they just want me to grab function f and add it with function g. Then I just substitute function f is given by 9x plus 1, which was in red, plus function g, which is x squared minus 4, which is given in blue. And then I just combine my like terms, okay? And I, and I always like to put in standard form, meaning in descending order. Our highest exponent always goes first, right? So I have an x squared. Nothing else has an x squared, so that goes first. Then I have a 9x. I don't have anything with an, with an x, so that goes next, plus 9x. But I do have two constants, right? These are similar. So I have a plus 1 with a minus 4. So plus 1 minus 4 is a minus 3, okay? So this is to review addition of functions, right? Some basic operations. So now let's do subtraction. Again, the syntax for subtraction is f minus g of x. Um, I always like to rewrite what this stands for. The subtraction of two functions just really means function f minus function g. And then I just replace, right? I, I replace what these um, signify. f of x, again, is 9x plus 1 minus, now because I have a subtraction, I want to use parentheses because I'm going to have to distribute that, that minus sign, yes? So we have parentheses x squared minus 4, which is function g. So let's simplify it by distributing that minus sign. A negative times a positive is going to give me a negative x squared. A negative with a negative is going to be a positive 4. And then again, I just combine my like terms. Again, I don't. I only have a squared factor, so I have minus x squared. I only have an x term, which is the 9x, but I have two constants again. I have a plus 1 and a plus 4. So plus 1 plus 4 is going to be plus 5. So this is a subtraction of these two functions. Okay. All right. We know that when we have two variables next to each other, this means multiplication. So we want to multiply these two functions together. Multiply function f with function, function g. Again, let's rewrite this. I like to rewrite this as, as a whole. f of x times g of x. Let's just do the replace. Since I am multiplying a polynomial, um, means that I have more than one term. Let's go ahead and put parentheses, right? I have a Parentheses 9x plus 1, that's function f, times parentheses x squared minus 4. This is function g. So to multiply this, we're going to do FOIL. Okay? This 9x term needs to be multiplied with the x squared, needs to multiply with the negative 4. So when we do that, 9x times x squared is a 9x cubed. 9x times minus 4 is a minus 36x. Now we have the second term. This term has to be multiplied with the x squared, has to be multiplied with the negative 4. So 1 times x squared is just x squared. 1 times a negative 4 is just a negative 4. So now we can combine like terms if we can. Um, and we don't. We don't have any like terms. So again, we like to put this in standard notation where the the highest exponent is goes first. So our highest exponent is at 3, so we have 9x cubed, next one plus x squared, minus 36x, minus 4. Again, this is just my preference. You don't have to do this on the computer. If you input this on the computer just like this, um, it's going to mark it right. But we always like to be, you know, proper and, and write things in a standard form way. All right, so that's the... Third basic operation. And the last is let's divide functions together. So we can divide function f with function g. So the, the syntax representation, uh, the full syntax representation is just function f of x divided by function g of x. Again, function f of x is 9x plus 1. Function g of x is x squared minus 4. Now, if these can be factored or simplified, Guess what? Our answer is just 9x plus 1 and x squared minus 4, okay? These x's cannot simplify because, again, these this x is attached to this 9. This x squared um, is belongs to just this x squared. So they're not, um, they're not factored out. They're not by themselves for us to cancel. So 
we leave the answer just like this. 9x plus 1 divided by x squared minus 4. Okay. Any questions? All right. So in your homework, you, were, you noticed that they always asked you um, to find the domain of the division of functions, right? And the reason for that is because we, you know now that whenever you have a um, rational expression, you know, a, a fraction problem, okay, we have a restriction on our domain. Our domain never wants to be, um, our denominator never wants to be equal to zero, right? Because then we have an undefined function. So that's why they ask us to, to state the domain of f divided by g. So we see, is there any value that I can put here for x that would make this whole function or this whole equation equal to zero? So let's see. So to solve for that, we set it equal to zero. We'll set x squared minus four equals to zero, and let's solve for x, and this will tell us the value of x that will make the denominator equal to zero. So to solve, we just um, solve for x. We add four on both sides. It's gonna give me x squared is equal to four. We take the square root property, take the square root of both sides. Okay, the square root of x squared is just x. The square root of four is gonna be plus or minus two. So I cannot use a positive two or a negative two for an x value down here because if I do, it's gonna give me a zero. Um, and again, it's an undefined um, function. So the restriction is plus or minus two. In interval notation, we would write it as from negative infinity to negative two. That's the all the numbers to the left of negative two that I can use except negative two. That's why we use a parentheses. This means that I cannot use this negative two. Again, and negative infinity is not a symbol. Uh, it's not an actual number. It's a number that goes on forever. So we always have the parentheses as a syntax for the infinity symbol, okay? So that's the left, all the numbers that are to the left of negative two. This union means and, that we still still have additional values that we can use. We can use the numbers between negative two and two. Again, not using negative two or positive two, and that's why we're using parentheses. And, um, or union, all the numbers to the right of two, okay? We start at two, not including two, but we can go from um, three all the way to positive infinity. So this is the answer in interval notation, okay? Any questions? Good. Okay. Let's move on. All right. So this the function have it in inverse. So let's do a little review before we talk about functions. Uh, we know that if we wanted to check for an equation or a function, if it was a function of a graph, we would do the vertical line test. A vertical line test proves that our graph is a function. And when we are using the vertical line, we're testing that every x value has only one value, yes? So opposite to a function is an inverse function. So opposite to a vertical line would be a horizontal line. So for us to check to see if a function has an inverse, we do what's called the horizontal line test. And what you're testing is that every y value has only an x value. So on this particular graph, the graph um, is in blue, this line. The red will signify our imaginary horizontal line. And when we do this imaginary horizontal line to this graph, we will see that every y value is only represented with one x value. So therefore, this graph has an inverse. So let's determine whether this function has an inverse. Now, we again, we can graph it um, to do our test. Um, but we could also do several other things. But before we do that, we need to, we need to uh, be aware of what type of function this is, right? So, so we see that this function is a square root function, right? It's a radical function, right? So, um, or a root function, that's uh, it's square root because when there's not a number here, it's 
automatically imply that there's a two or square root, okay? But this is a root function. Um, and we need to know, we, need, we know that a square root functions, we only can have positive values for our x, right? So um, since this root function will pass the vertical and horizontal line test, therefore this has an inverse function, okay? All right, so to check this algebraically, what we can do is let's go ahead and replace the f of x with y, okay? Then we're going to interchange the values, x and y, to find the inverse, okay? So if I wanna find the inverse, I'm going to interchange the x and y values. So my y value is gonna become x, my x value is gonna become y. So let's go ahead and find its inverse. So to find the inverse, we're going to solve for y. So to get rid of the square root, I'm gonna take the square of both sides. When I square, the, the square root of y minus a, um, you know, our students say they, they cancel, so we eliminate the square root. So on the left side, we have the x squared. So to solve for y, we're just going to add 8 on both sides. So we have x squared plus 8 is equal to y. Now, this is an equation. Very common mistake students make is to, to signify that what we just solved for was the inverse. We have to use this notation, yes? f to the exponent of a negative one, right? So this means that we have an, the inverse. So the inverse is indicated as f to the negative one of x is equal to x squared plus eight. So these two functions, the function f of x, square root of x minus eight, its inverse is x squared plus eight, okay? So to solve for inverse, we replace the x and y values. We interchange them. All right, so let's look at this problem. Problem says, sketch the graph of the function by applying the leading coefficient test, finding the real zeros of the polynomial, plotting sufficient solution points, and drawing a continuous curve through the points, okay? So we have the function g of x is equal to negative x squared plus 12x minus 32, okay? So the first thing we need to do is apply the leading coefficient test. Okay, so um, here, the first thing that we need to see is that we're dealing with a quadratic, right? So the graph of this is a parabola, okay? So we know that from the leading coefficient test, if the, the a, the number in front, or the, the sign in front of the leading coefficient, which is the x squared, if this is a negative, we know that the parabola, okay, is going to be pointing down, right? It's going to be like this. So let's see here. Let's let's see what they give us on the multiple choice. It says that the graph of the function rises to the left and rises to the right. And that's not the case. This one is going down, right? This, this is telling that the arrows are pointing up. So the answer for this one is here, the graph of the function, um, says rises to the left and falls to the right. That's not true either. The graph of the function falls to the left and rises to the right. That's not true either. And here, the graph of the function falls to the left and falls to the right. This is what's happening with our, our parabola, right? So our answer is this last one, D, or, or our last one. Oops. Oh, so I'm giving you the answer. So um, let's go ahead and, and review our real zero our our leading coefficient test just to review okay if our um sign for the leading coefficient is a positive for a parabola quadratic again it's going to be pointing up right it rises to the right and and rises on the left yes if our leading coefficient is a negative it's going to fall on the right fall on the left. And these were for the cube. These were the, the definitions that they were giving us in, in our uh, math problem, right? For a cube function, okay, if it's positive, it rises on the right and falls on the left. If the leading coefficient is a negative, it rises on the left and falls on the right, okay? So again, 
ours, we know that we have this scenario going on. We have um, a negative for our leading coefficient. So we know that our answer again is going to be um, this last one, right? Very good. Any questions? All right, so, so now we have B. Find the real zeros of the polynomial. Enter your answer as a comma separated list. If there's no solution, enter no solution, right? So um, since the quadratic, there's several ways to finding the real zeros, and we can factor it. We can use the quadratic equation since it's a quadratic. So in, in our example, the easiest... Oh, method I always think or approach is trying to see if we can factor it. So this 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 quadratic is factorable. This quadratic can factor by um, multiplying x minus 8 times x minus 4. So again I'm using my 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 zero property that in order for me to get an answer for zero either this is zero or this is zero. So you see that um, x minus 8 if my value for x is 8, I'll get a 0, right? 8 minus 8 is 0, so that will become 0. I can clearly see here that for this to be 0, x has to be 4. 4 minus 4 will give me 0. So the real zeros, um, the way I would input them on the computer, okay, as is, uh, it would be as a list, okay? Um, oops, um, let me go back. So um, it would be, you know, Four and then comma eight. Yes. All right. But we can practice um, again the end behavior of this graph. We know that it falls on the right, falls on the left, and we wanted to graph it. Okay. Um, we would want to find all of our possible points to to get an accurate graph. So let's find its y-intercept. So again, to find the y-intercept, we set x equal to zero. So here I replaced um, x by 0, so we have 0 squared, we have 12 times 0, so we solve, okay, y is equal to negative 32, okay? We can also find the vertex. We have a formula given to us to find the vertex. It says here that we can find the vertex by um, minus b over 2a, and that same value plug it into the function. So to review a little bit, and when we have a quadratic, um, the general form of this is given by ax squared plus bx plus c, okay? So I see here, okay, in my case, the b value in, in my problem is 12, okay? My a value would be a negative 1, yeah? So when I do that, when I plug in these values, okay, my b is a 12, my a is a negative 1. When I simplify, I get equals 6. So the x value of the vertex is at um, 6. That's the x value of the vertex. Now to find the y value of the vertex, I just have to get this value, 6, and plug it back in to the function g of x. So everywhere I see x, I'm going to plug in 6. So when I do that, um, minus 6 x squared, uh, 6 squared plus 12 times 6 minus 32 is going to give me 4. So the vertex of this parabola is at 6, 4. So when I put all these values together, I'm able to graph or give a, a very um, close, accurate representation of this graph, right? My vertex is at 6, 4, 6 units to the right. Four units up, that here is my vertex. Okay. This is my vertex. I have found my zeros or my x-intercepts. I have an x-intercept at 4, 1 at 8. Um, again, I can show it on my graph here because of my dimensions, but I know that I had a y-intercept at negative 32. So way down here, my graph is going to cross the y-axis. Yes? So this was just a review on, on all the points that we would need in order to get a very 
good graph. And, and on your computer, these were multiple choice, so very easy to get and solve. All right. <clears throat> so to find the rational zeros of a polynomial function, we can use what's called the rational zero test. Okay. Um, and to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to divide our constant, all the our are the value of the constant by our leading coefficient. And we're going to find all of the factors in order to get all of the possible zeros. So on, on this particular problem, okay, that we have x cubed plus x squared minus 9x minus 9. Our constant value is 9. And again, I'm not interested in its sign, okay? And the reason why I'm not interested in the sign is because I'm going to look at all of the, the factors, all the possible values that it could have. So I don't, I'm not, I'm, I really don't mind or I shouldn't pay attention so much on its side, okay? The leading coefficient here is one. And again, it's a positive one, but I'm not interested in the sign. I'm just interested in the value because I'm going to look at all of the options. Again, my, my factor, my value is nine. So all of the factors for nine are going to be one, three, and nine. And again, I'm going to look at all possibilities. I'm going to look at Positive 1, negative 1. Positive 3, negative 3. Positive 9, negative 9. The factor of 1, it only has 1, which is 1. I'm going to look at both, right? Plus or minus 1. So to use the rational zero test, I'm going to divide plus 1 by 1, plus 1, plus 3, plus 1, plus 9. That's going to give me all the positive values, right? 1, 3, 9. Then I'm going to divide by the negative. Negative 1 um, with a positive will give me a negative 1, negative 3, and negative 9. Then I would do it again. Then I would use the different signs. But again, we don't want to do duplicates. When I divide with a, with a negative and I alternate, again, I'm going to have the same values again. I'm going to get the negative 9, negative 3, and negative 1. Since I already have them there, we don't write duplicates when when answering all the possible rational zeros. And again, these, this is not telling me that these are the zeros for this function. Okay, These are just the possible zeros. And again, we know that this function, because it's a Q function, it can have at most three zeros. It has at least one, but it's going to have at most three zeros. And here it gave me, you know, six. We know I know that this does not have six zeros okay so this is just to find all of the possible zeros for this function all right so now if i wanted to find an actual zero one of the tools that we gave you as an arsenal to find um, zeros is to use synthetic division so let's use one of our possible zeros to test to see if it is in fact a real zero so Again, to use synthetic division, the first thing we need to make sure is that our function is in descending order, that all of our values are in the right placement, and also that I have um, values for all, okay? So I have my high exponent is a cube, so I have to have a value for square, for the x, and the constant, and I do, right? I have a placement value for all, and the function is already in descending order. So let's just get the coefficients of all of our placement values. Here we have a 1, 1, a negative 9, and a, and a negative 9. Oops, little typo here. This should be negative 9, OK? I'm going to use the first um, possible 0, 1. Again, to use synthetic division, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to bring down my 1, OK? And I'm going to multiply 1 times 1 is 1, and then I'm going to add 1 plus 1 is 2. Then I do it again. 1 times 2 is 2, and then I add negative 9 plus 2 is a negative 7. Then I multiply 1 times negative 7 is a negative 7. Again, um, this should be negative, so this should give me a, a negative 16. Okay, so now. Um, since either way, this uh, this last value was not zero, okay. 
this is not zero that means that I actually have a remainder that is telling me that one is not a zero for this polynomial that if I would plug in one here this would not give me zero so let me go ahead and test another point okay one is not a zero all right let's test negative one again I apologize we have a little typo here this should be a negative nine so again let's use synthetic division again let's go ahead and bring down the one negative one times one is a negative one add one minus one is zero multiply negative one times zero that's going to give me zero negative nine plus zero is a negative nine okay multiply a negative one times a negative nine that's going to be a positive nine and again we have a negative nine here this one is correct negative nine plus nine gives me zero so excellent so this is telling me that negative one is a zero so actually i found an actual zero now what i can do is i can get my um, quotient from my synthetic division to find my other zeros okay so um, my quotient here okay um, remember when you divide you always lose a placement value so we started with a cube so we're going to end up with a first value here is a square so this is one we have x squared the zero indicates that we don't have a we have this we have zero x we don't have a value for x so that zero times x is just zero but this last one is our constant negative nine and again this zero indicates that it's our remainder okay and that means that the negative one was a zero for this so our quotient is x squared minus nine so i can solve for x in order for for me to find the other zeros and to do that i'm just going to set it equal to zero and solve for x so i'm going to add nine on both sides going to give me x squared is equal to nine again use my square root properties take the square root of both sides okay when i take the square root of a square these we say that they cancel okay and the square root of nine is going to be plus or minus three so this function in fact has three zeros it has a zero at x equals negative one x equals negative three x equals three okay so we could also um, find the factors to find the factors you just move the numbers to the other side right um, negative add a one on both sides so the factor would be x plus one add a three on both sides the other factor is x plus three subtract a three on both sides would be x minus three okay so this is whenever they want you to find the linear factors and please pay very attention because you have some problems that they want you to find the linear factors that means that all the exponents here are one okay so these are the linear factors for this polynomial all right, so if we were to plot our zeros, okay, um, here we have the negative three, the negative one, the positive three. Now we could also refer back to our, our leading coefficient test, okay? We have a cube, okay? And if I go back, let's just um, have a cube here. My leading coefficient is positive. So that what that means for a cube polynomial, it's going to fall on the left and rise on the right okay so when i graph this okay i put it in my leading coefficient uh, information i know that this graph is going to fall on the left and rise on the right okay so we can get a test with several points just to get a, a more accurate picture of this we can plug in values in order to to get a better graph and again I, I tried two values I plug I used negative two I wanted to see what the behavior of the graph was to the left of my negative one I wanted to see where does the graph go here and it sees and it says that when I plug in a negative two uh, my y value is five so we have one two three four five so my graph at negative two goes over here right so um, I also wanted to find out what it what the graph is doing next to or to the right of the negative one uh, but not in between 
the positive 3. So I choose 2, right? Um, so when I plugged in 2 for x, my y value was negative 6. So this is telling me that when x is 2, okay, I got some value here at negative 6. And then I also wanted to test at 1, right, just to get a better uh, accuracy. When I used x is equal to 1, my y values was negative 16. So when I put plot these points in, oops, I didn't do it. So let me go ahead and do that. Let me go ahead and plug them in. Um, and then I put them in red at different colors so you can see them. So let's plug in these two points. Here I have when x is negative 2, my y value was 5. So we can say that it's there. Okay. When x is 2, my y value was negative 6. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, let's say right here. Okay. And when um, x was 1, I got a negative 16. So it's like way down here. So I'm just going to uh, more or less guess. So if I were to finish this graph, okay, um, we would have something like this, right? Uh, right? Something like that, right? So again, and this is just to get an, um, an idea on the graph. Again, when you're given these on a the computer, they ask you to do the multiple choice. Choose the right graph, right? All right, so let's move on. Um, let's go to a, another problem. We have this. Use the given zeros to find the zeros of the function. So we have function g of x is equal to x cubed minus 12x squared plus 52x minus 80. And they're telling me that this function has a zero with this given factor, 4 plus 2i. Hey, again, just to review, uh, we know that this um, factor here is an imaginary factor, right? We have a, a complex number, and we know that because of the i, right? i means it, it stands for the imaginary, okay? So let's go ahead and, and use, again, our synthetic division to simplify this cube. And we want to do synthetic division because by simplifying this factor, this, excuse me, this function, we can go from a cube to a quadratic, and then we have formulas in order for us to solve all the remaining zeros, right? We can factor it. We can use a quadratic equation. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's simplify it to get a quadratic. So we're going to use synthetic division. The first thing I need to do, again, is make sure that I have a placement value for all, and it's in the right order. So I have a q, a square, a 1, and a constant. So yes, it's in the right order. So and um, let's go ahead and get our values. So we have a 1 here. Um, and we don't write it, but we know that there's a 1 here for our first coefficient. We have a negative 12. We have a positive 52. And we have a negative 80. So let's go ahead and do synthetic division. Again, we bring down the 1. We multiply. 4 plus 2i times 1 is going to give me a 4 plus 2i. Again, we're just going to... Um, this one has no imaginary part, so we, when we are adding complex numbers, we add real with real, the real part with, each, with the real part, and imaginary part with the imaginary part. So on this one, we just have the real parts to add. We're going to add a negative 12 with a positive 4. It's going to give me a negative 8, and we just have the plus 2i with a 0i, because there's no imaginary part, just going to give me the 2i. Okay? Again, we're going to multiply again. Um, but on this one, we're going to use 4 because now we have, you know, two factors to multiply, right? We're going to multiply the 4 times the negative 8, the 4 times the 2i, the 2i times the negative 8, and the 2i times the plus 2i. So when we do that, okay, we get this, negative 32 plus 8i minus 16i plus 4i squared. We want to combine our like terms. We can combine the 8i with a minus 16i which is going to give me a negative 8i, okay? We know that the i squared is a negative 1. So when we add the negative 1 times 4 is going to be a negative 4. Um, and then now we have, we can add our constants, right? Negative 32 with a negative 4 is going to give me a negative 36, right? So we have negative 36, 8i. So again, let's go ahead and add. The real with the real, 52 minus 36 is going to give me 16, again, with a minus 8i. 
Let's go ahead and do the multiplication again. Okay, we get this. Let's simplify. We have 64 minus 16 i squared. Again, i squared is a negative 1. So this is going to give me uh, a negative 16 times a negative 1, which is going to be a positive 16. So 64 plus 16 is 80, and negative 80 plus 80 is 0. So um, when we did that, okay, again, the whole point of doing this was to simplify the um, the Q function. Now we have a quadratic function. So again, let's do the same thing that we did before. We lose a, uh, an exponent, so we have x squared. Then our next term is a negative 8 plus 2ix plus 16 minus 8i. Okay? Let's simplify. Okay, So what we can do is, um, since we have complex numbers, let's go ahead and use synthetic division again to simplify this equation even further, right? So, and, and this is, again, we want to do this so we can practice um, playing with complex numbers. So let's go ahead and do the synthetic division again. 4 minus 2i times 1 is just a 4 minus 2i, as stated before. Now that we have full complex numbers, to add complex numbers is just real with real, imaginary with imaginary. A negative 8 plus 4 is a negative 4. A positive 2i minus 2i, it's 0, so it just leaves me with a negative 4. Let's multiply again. So we're going to have negative uh, 4 times a negative 4 is a negative 16. Negative 2i with a negative 4 is a positive 8i. Then when we add these, we see that we the 0. So we're left with 1 minus 4. So what this is saying is we have x minus 4 is equal to 0. Okay, So our x value to solve, we add 4 on both sides. It's going to be x equals 4. Okay? So our zeros for this are x equals 0. Um, oops, it should be 4, right? So x equals 4. Um, then we have 4 plus 2i and 4 minus 2i. Yes? All right. Any questions? Okay. All right. So now let's look at this rational expression. So we have um, this function, which is equal to f of x is equal to 1 over x plus 3, and a state the domain. Again, because we have a fraction function, right, we never want the denominator to be equal to zero. So we have a restriction on our denominator. So when is that? If we can't see it, we said x plus 3 is equal to zero, okay? So if we solve for x, right, if we have x plus 3, if we don't see it, x plus 3 equals to zero, Okay. We can see that if x is equal to negative 3, negative 3 plus 3 will give me a 0. So which is the answer? Okay. Um, this is On this one, it's saying that it's all real numbers except 1 and negative 3. No, we, only, we can only not use negative 3. So the answer is this last one, right? All real numbers except when x is equal to negative 3. We cannot use negative 3 because... This will give us a zero for our denominator, giving us an undefined, right, function. So B, identify all the intercepts. So to, to find the intercepts, again, if I want to find the x-intercept, I set y equal to zero. To find the y-intercept, I set x equal to zero. Um, and then we'll take a look at this. There's several um, conditions or cases that we need to check for for the vertical and horizontal line test. So but let's go ahead and um, move forward, just give you the answer. So we know that it's a fraction. Again, I'm trying to go quick as I'm, I have five more minutes um, and I want to just find, finish this problem. Um, so again, we know that um, there's a restriction on a domain. We saw that if x is equal to negative 3, um, we get an undefined function. So our answer is excluding negative 3, which is that last answer. Okay. Um, to find the x-intercept, we set y equal to 0. 
So we replace f of x by y, and then we replace the y by 0, giving us 0 is equal to 1 over x plus 3. So to solve, we need to multiply x plus 3 on both sides. And we see that when we do that, we have 0 is equal to 1. That's not true. So what this is saying is that this graph does not have an x-intercept. So we would type on the computer, does not exist. Yes? Again, to find our y-intercept, we set x equal to 0. So uh, again, everywhere I see x, I'm going to plug in 0. So we have 0 plus 3 is 3. So when we simplify, um, our y-intercept would be at one third, right? So our ordered pair, when x is equal to 0, y is equal to one third. So that's our, our y-intercept. And again, I wanted to find an ordered pair because that's what the the, the computer is telling me to, to write the answers for, right, as an ordered pair. All right, now, to find the vertical hor and horizontal asymptotes, um, the first one, let's do the, the vertical asymptote. So the vertical asymptote, basically, this one is, you, you solved it already. Um, this is the, any restrictions on the x, right? It's a value where, where, where um, we can now cross a this vertical line in the x value. So we did that when we solve for for the domain of this uh, rational expression, right? So on this particular problem, when our denominator was equal to zero, that was that was our domain. But that's also our equation for the vertical asymptote. This has a vertical asymptote at x equals negative three. Okay, because again, the asymptote to review really quick is this imaginary line that the graph cannot cross or touch. Again, it's undefined at that point, and we solve that algebraically. Okay, to find the horizontal asymptote, oh, and we represent it in a graph, and we represent the asymptotes, they're always indicated, and you have to um, draw them as a dashed line. Okay, this is dotted, but it's a dashed line on the computer. Okay. For the horizontal asymptotes, you have several cases, yes? So case one, if the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator, you have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. If the degree of the numerator is equal to the degree of the denominator, then um, your horizontal asymptote is the division or fraction of the leading coefficient of the numerator divided by the leading coefficient of the denominator. And the last case, if the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator, then it has no horizontal asymptote. Now, we say that this has a slant asymptote, but we won't, I don't think we're going to get to go over that really quick. So just to finalize our last one, we see that we can rewrite the numerator as x to 0, right? Anything to the 0 power is 1. So, so here we see that the the degree of the numerator is 0, the degree of the denominator is 1. So here, the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator, so that means that it has a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, okay? So this uh, will be the last example that I have time for. I have a few seconds left. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. I want to thank you all for for participating to um, meeting with us these happy math hours. I hope this last review helps you um, acing your finals. I know you're all going to do very well in your math classes. So again, if you have any additional questions, we still have tutors this week. Um, you can stay and um, ask for help with our tutors. They they're awesome. Okay, they they can help you with any questions you may have. Ms. Chuka, do you have any last words? Uh, no, just thank you, and um, I, I know you all do great. Thank you, Mr. Carrizales. Thank you, Ms. Chuka, and thank you to all our viewers. Uh, we hope to see you uh, on other TVEs, but this is the final one for this semester. Um, and I'd like to say good luck to all of you for your finals.